So I just have three very simple jobs. Number one, I have to welcome you to day two of the R&D Management Conference. Oh, I should explain who I am. I'm Tim Minchell. I'm one of the uh, members of the large team that uh, organized this conference. Second task is to very, very briefly introduce our uh, outstanding keynote speakers. And thirdly, to make sure everyone gets to coffee on time at 10.30. Okay? So the introduction is going to be extremely brief. So yesterday, we had two great keynote speakers from a highly uh, practitioner background. So we had Warren East talking about the challenges of innovating around complex uh, manufactured systems and how these link to the digital world. And then we had Joe D'Souza talking about the challenges from an AstraZeneca perspective um, of innovating in the healthcare sector, particularly pharmaceuticals. So today, we're trying to connect the world of practice with the world of research, and we could not wish for two better keynote speakers. So we're first going to hear from David Teese um, uh, uh, on the topic specifically of um, profiting from innovation in the digital economy. And then we're going to hear from Mark Samuels from the perspective of the National Institute for Health Research. So both speakers have around 35 to 40 minutes for their talk, and then there'll be time for questions after each one. So, I think without any further ado, could you please join me in welcoming the most highly cited scholar in the field of technology management, David Teese. It's a great pleasure to be here at Cambridge, one of the greatest institutions on the planet Earth when it comes to, to research and higher education. Um, let me, if I may, spend 30 minutes uh, talking to you about what I consider to be one of the most fundamental questions in technology management. And that is, and that is how do you win at the game? And in particular, how do you capture value as an innovator? Of course, the flip side of that is if you're not an innovator, there's value to be captured as well. But my primary focus today is the same focus that uh, was in a paper I published in Research Policy in 86, which is titled Profiting from Innovation. But I want to take the framework there and see if it needs to be updated for the digital economy. Let me go back and sort of remind you of key themes. And it's appropriate that I'm talking about this topic here in the UK because it was the UK experience which actually triggered me to write this paper in the first place. As a scholar, I was struck by the fact that Britain in the 50s and 60s had contributed so much to global science and technology. I was thinking not just about nuclear power and the hovercraft, but the civilian jet airplane, um, CT scanner, um, uh, Britain had a long history of making tremendous pioneering contributions, scientifically and technologically, uh, but marketplace success uh, was not uh, being achieved. And, and that conundrum, how come you can be a pioneer, not just a scientific pioneer, but how come you can actually get products into the market, and products that we know from experience in an ex post sense, uh, going to succeed and create tremendous value for society, how come the innovator ends up uh, with empty pockets? Um, and it was first, you know, the UK experience, and then in the 80s, uh, many great American companies uh, suffered similar fates with Japanese competition. Uh, think about the VCR, for instance, that was invented by Ampex, but didn't do anything significant with it. And companies like Xerox with Xerox Park that invented all the foundational technologies associated with the PC industry, but failed to commercialize on it. So that was the question that I was asking then, and it's the same question that I'm asking now. And to try and answer that question, I came up with this simple framework, which has come to be known as a profiting from innovation framework. Uh, and there are a few key variables. The nice thing I would like to think about this paper is, there is actually a theory behind it, and there's a few sort of independent variables. There's not much structure given to how these things interact. So it's not highbrow theory, there's no theorems. Uh, but there are a few key ideas. And the first one was that the answer depends in part on what I call the strength of the appropriability regime. 
And that's not just your intellectual property protection, which you may or may not have, but it's also the nature of knowledge itself and how easy it is for, how easy it is for people to copy what you've done. So that was one sort of key anchor to the framework. Uh, second key anchor was standards and timing. Uh, did you arrive with the product at the right time? Were you too early or too late? There's so much about the first mover advantage, but in fact, if you look closely at innovation history, uh, it's, uh, it's often the case that it's the number two or three or the number N that ends up win winning, not the first. So, so we know there's not a lot of support for the first mover, although in some cases the first mover is important. Those cases are typically where there's a significant installed base effect, which is not true with many technologies, but it is true with some. So getting the timing right is another key set of factors. The third set of factors which I highlighted, um, which in the digital world I think are uh, even more important uh, than, uh, than I recognized at the time, is what I call complementary assets and complementary technologies. When you think about it, just about every innovation takes something else, you know, either other technologies or uh, other systems uh, such as manufacturing or after sales service, other assets. So, you know, it's very rare that you find something that once invented is ready for market. It usually has to be combined with other things. In fact, Schumpeter told us that innovation is fundamentally about new combinations, but he didn't tell us what those combinations were. Uh, and I would like to suggest that uh, frequently, uh, and increasingly frequently in the digital world is complementary technologies uh, that are critical. And then finally, the sort of strategy business model issues. Uh, my uh, good friend and colleague at Berkeley, Hank Chesbra, uh, sort of got us focused, I think, on thinking about the fact that, that the business model may be as important as the technology itself. Uh, in getting things to market and succeeding. Uh, and in fact, it's our friends at Xerox Park that first began articulating the fundamental problem of what's the architecture of revenues, was the term they used. What's the architecture of revenues for new technologies? And if we can't figure out what the architecture of revenues are, or what today we think of as what's a business model that can enable you to make a profit, then you could have the most powerful and pioneering things in the world. Uh, but you won't make any money. So this was a simple framework that I laid out. Uh, there's a simple business model behind it. It's only got two variables. Do you integrate or do you license? And, and, uh, and, and, and this little flow diagram you know, asks you a series of questions. What's the state of your intellectual property protection? Do you have a patent? Is that patent imitable? Uh, what other complementary assets are needed? And then it would tell you whether or not you can when, whether you should contract or license, or whether you should joint venture, or whether you need to build the whole shooting box yourself. And in fact, um, I, I looked at this um, a few years later and asked myself, well, is this framework still viable? Is this basic framework stu still viable? What's missing? What I didn't really stress very much was installed base effects. Um, and I underplayed, talking about complementary assets, I underplayed complementary innovations. Um, and, and the more I thought about it, I thought there's one simple way, and I'll suggest this to all of you, that you can think about the profiting from innovation problem, and that's to ask yourself, what's the bottleneck asset? Is it the technology or is it something else? And the money's gonna go to who's got the bottleneck asset, who owns it or who effectively controls it. And I would suggest to you that that's still true. If you're trying to understand who profits from innovation, ask the question, what does it take to get it to market? Who owns those other components of the system? Who owns what's needed? Who controls what's needed? It could be standards, it may not be standards. Who owns the other bits of the puzzle? And are those bits easily replicable? If the answer is no, then somebody else is gonna win. If they're easily replicable or easily accessible, the pioneer has a good chance of succeeding. And in fact, it led to this simple framework which actually predicted how the profits get divided up. I won't bother to spend any time on that, it's in the original paper. 
What I want to do today, given the theme of this conference, is say, all right, in the world we're in today, where the techno business environment has changed, what I was looking at is a simple story where you had sort of single patent, single product. Um, there weren't multiple ecosystems. There weren't multiple layers to the story. It was a simple story where someone's got a successful invention. Uh, we know that it's going to succeed. What's the way to bring it to market? In the techno business environment of today, things are a little different. Um, digital convergence uh, is upon us. The analog world is gone. The digital world is with us, and that means that things can... Uh, that information and, and, and connections can be made and replicated uh, with relative ease. So boundaries between industry are blurring as a consequence of this. Uh, and the Internet, of course, is maybe the, the macro ecosystem that many industries are confronting. So the Internet is increasingly per pervasive. Does that change the way we look at things? <laughs> Are installed base effects as important as they used to be? I suggest to you they probably aren't. Google's advantage doesn't come as much from the installed base as it does from all the complementary technologies that it's able to create or access or harness. And the world is no longer the one patent, one product world. It's multi, what I call the multi-invention world, where just about every product, including the iPhone that's in my pocket, it's got thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of technologies that it combined. I don't know what the number is, but I think the number of patents that the iPhone reads on is, you know, 30, 40, 50, 100,000. And of course, there's a bunch of other technologies that are not, uh, not patented that are relevant as well. So, so we know that things are now uh, different and a mark of a good theory or a framework is, is it robust enough? Is the old 86 framework on profiting from innovation still relevant, or do we have to throw the whole thing out the window and start all over again? Of course, I'd like to think not, uh, but it's for you to judge by the end of, the, uh, of my talk. But let me suggest that at least the framework needs some extensions or some changes in emphasis to take into account today's digital economy. One thing I did not highlight, but which was important then and is important now, is what I call enabling technologies. <clears throat> Some people, in fact, the economic historians have been playing with this concept for at least half a century. There's a, there's a type of technology out there called general purpose technology. You know, think of things like the laser. Think of things like the steam engine. Think of things like the microprocessor. These are general purpose technologies because they open up opportunities for other technologies. They're pervasive, they have very high potential. Uh, they enhance research productivity like recombinant DNA. Uh, they make contributions way beyond what most technologies are able to produce. And, uh, uh, think of the profiting from innovation challenge if you are an inventor uh, or creator of an enabling technology. I would suggest and try and resolve that there are special problems associated with building business models that would give you a chance of even getting a tiny slice of the upside associated with such technologies. Um, and as I said before, general purpose technologies often get created and they sit around for a while without, you know, um, without a, a, a large variety of applications. Like we forget the initial steam engine was for pumping water out of coal mines. And it took many years, it took decades before the steam engine morphed into something more. And of course there were other technologies that were added on to make it useful in railroads and in steamships, et cetera, et cetera. But, 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 but without the initial invention, uh, that wouldn't have happened. As a consequence, I think it's useful to recognize that in the digital world, there are important enabling technologies. When you look at the wireless space, for instance, when you look at basic communications technologies, there's a lot of critical enabling technologies that get rolled into 2G, 3G, 4G, and down the road 5G. 
uh, and the, 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 the challenge associated with actually profiting from providing those enabling technologies is very hard, despite the fact that everybody in the industry relies on those enabling technologies to bring out the next generation of devices. So there are some special issues there. There are also special issues around complementarities. In my earlier research, I broke the world down into specific complements or generic complements. I want to suggest you, to you today that there's more to the story than that. Uh, and the good news is there, there are some distinctions in the economics literature, including some provided by some Cambridge economists that we want to dwell upon. And then finally, with respect to business model design, we know a lot more about business models now, at least for the last you know, a couple of decades, a lot of people have been thinking seriously about the design of business models, and I'd like to try and fold that into my research here on profiting from innovation. <clears throat> First of all, let me back up and talk a little bit about general purpose technologies um, and think about the business model challenge. If you come up with a general purpose technology that's applicable, let's say, in n different sectors of the economy, how are you ever, as the innovator, going to tap into those end sectors? Well, as a practical matter, you know, unless you are the whole economy, unless you're a very large diversified firm, you can't. So you're stuck with licensing. Uh, uh, so if you get anything out of it at all, it's going to be through licensing. And as I'll explain later, uh, licensing is not a very efficient way, uh, not a very effective way, uh, to capture value from technology. Because it requires the courts to cooperate uh, and there's lots of ways in which infringers can, can get around um, intellectual property. But it also means, it also means you have to engage with partners. So all of the stuff in the literature on strategic alliances and partnerships, of course, all of that is put into hyperdrive if you're thinking about general purpose technology. If a company has a general purpose technology that's come out of the labs or has been able to put together, then you have to immediately think about all the different potential application areas. And in fact, universities are often confronted with this because a lot of the general purpose stuff, or some of it at least, comes out of universities. So, so complements and complementary technologies uh, take on special significance which means, of course, that fundamentally there are business model challenges associated with capturing value from general purpose technologies. And that's not something I addressed in my original paper, but it's something that I'm giving attention to today. Now, let me come back to this question of compliments. As I said at the beginning, the one thing that I put my finger on uh, some years ago, and I didn't realize how important it is, and the digital economy has made it more important, is compliments. But what can we say systematically about compliments? The answer is almost nothing. Um, almost nothing. In fact, I've scrounged up a quote from Paul Samuelson, the Nobel laureate economist. Uh, and while it's 40 years old, I think it's still substantially true. He says, the time is ripe for a fresh, modern look at the concept of complementarity. And then he goes on in the last sentence to say, the simplest things are often the most complicated to understand fully. And uh, when you get that from a Nobel laureate, you know that there's something big sitting there that you need to understand a little better. So I've gone back to the totality of writings in economics since my initial training was in economics and economists. If you go to the standard economics textbook, there is actually a definition of, of compliments. And, uh, and uh, it's usually traced to, to John Hicks, um, who I think was a Cambridge economist. Uh, and uh, one of his classic definitions of a complement is that if you increase the price of one product, then it decreases the amount of another one you want to buy. So the classic case is price of gasoline goes up, the demand for cars goes down, et cetera, et cetera. And then Edgeworth, another famous economist, talked about the utility. If the utility I get from one product increases with another product, like if I like both pepper and salt together, then they're complements. If I don't like them together, they're not. And that's not a very helpful definition for our purposes, but that's one definition of a compliment. Hirschleifer, um, a very famous financial economist, wrote a much more interesting paper that's gone unnoticed for about 40 years, where he points out that innovation can have the effect 
of raising the prices of certain asset classes and decreasing the prices of other asset classes. So he, he brought the conundrum to the world of how come? Think about Eli Whitney inventing the cotton gin. The guy died penniless, but the global economy changed. The price of land in the southern United States went up, you know, the price of shirts went down. For anyone taking finance 101, you say, well, okay, if asset prices are going to change and I got the innovation and I got prior knowledge of this, surely I can take a hedging position somewhere or take a position in financial markets to profit from it. The answer is, of course, that Edgeworth did not, excuse me, that, that, that uh, Whitney did not, but it does raise the question that one way you can profit from innovation is to not even engage in it, but just think about what the asset price implications of innovation are going to be. And in fact, there are guys on Wall Street and here in London who do exactly that. Uh, and that doesn't foreclose the innovator from doing it either. The point is that one way in which you can capture value from innovation is to actually look at and predict, based on your proprietary information, what's going to happen to the price of assets that are related. That's sort of an interesting point, but it's not mainstream. And then along comes Auguste Corneau, the famous French economist, who says that, well, some goods are used together but sold separately, and uh, you've got to have a royalty stacking problem is the way in which this uh, has played out in the economics literature, because uh, everyone that's got a, a technology that's necessary to bring things to market is going to overcharge to try and extract all the monopoly profits. Well, actually, that doesn't happen, but it's a nice theoretical idea. The form of complementarity that really matters is what I'll call technology complementarity, uh, where the full benefit of a technology requires another complementary technology. And think about general purpose technology. Think about the value of the laser once you combine it with optical fibers, or the importance of optical fibers given that, it, that, la that, that lasers existed. That, that, that these are the kinds of complementarities that matter, and these are the types of complementarities that innovators need to pay attention to. So you've seen this struggle, for instance, with the microprocessor in memory. You know, until you had DRAM, you couldn't really get graphic processors. Uh, uh, you know, you, you, you couldn't have video games until you had memory that was easy to access. And now you've got Intel coming up with uh, entirely new memory technology called X-Point that's a thousand times faster for volatile memory than other forms of memory. And that then creates new opportunities for the microprocessors. So you have in the digital economy these constant interplays between technologies and how one technology benefit is a function of what's going on in technological development elsewhere. And if you can't get your arms around that, you're unlikely to understand profiting from innovation. So what, if anything, does this tell us? Well, I could spend more time on this, but the key points I want to make with respect to complements are the following. First of all, they're absolutely critical. You can't have a discussion about profiting from innovation or capturing value from innovation without also having a discussion about what are the complements now and in the future, and who owns them and who controls them. And your strategy has to be to get your arms around that. Uh, Schumpeter, as I said, didn't give us much advice. He just told us that new combinations matter. There is a literature out there which is quite interesting by Tushman and others, Tushman and Anderson, which talks about competency destroying and incompetency enhancing innovation. Um, and, and that, I think, is one. Uh, one way to think about what Tushman has been trying to tell us all the time is that, that, that there are complementary assets that go down in value and up in value. It's very much similar to the Hirsch life type argument. By the way, it's not the disruption story. You know, everything today is about disruption. But without an understanding of complements, how can you talk meaningfully about disruption? Disrupting what? Which complements? Which substitutes? It seems to me that any meaningful discussion on technological disruption has to take into account complements and has to have a fine-grained story about complements attached to it. As I said before, neither the Edgeworth or Corneau stories is particularly relevant. But what is relevant is that most inventions involve 
multiple combinations of technologies. So, uh, so much uh, for that. So complements are even more significant, and in my view, they dwarf the installed base effects, they dwarf switching cost stories. That's what the textbooks are still stuck on, but there's a new story that has to be told around articulating uh, a more fine-grained story about complements. But there's also a lot to say about standards and platforms, and there's, as most of you are aware, in the academic literature, tremendous amount of attention now that's given to platforms, which are defined as meta-organizations that federate and coordinate constituent agents, create value by generating and harnessing economies of scope. Well, of course, what you realize when you start thinking about platforms is it's also a story about complements, but they don't tend to use the word complements when they talk about platforms. But underneath and behind every platform is some story about complementarities, and that's the story that has to be ferreted out if you have, want to have any chance of understanding where the money's going to go uh, in, this, uh, in this environment. And then with respect to standards, we need a more granular understanding of standards. I, for one, used to think that Stanford's standards were just about compatibility issues. But I've come to understand, and particularly in the cellular telephony area and in mobile phones, that there's a lot of technology that gets developed and put into standards. Whereas in the auto industry of years ago, engineers sat around and decided, you know, how many, um, you know, what the thread should look like on a screw or whatever. Uh, in today's negotiations or discussions at the IEEE and at Etsy, then the discussion is around, you know, how can we make the transmission of data uploading, download faster? What are the technologies that help do that? And different companies will offer different technologies, and a new standard will, in fact, have embedded within it a considerable amount of innovation. So I like to make a distinction between what I call standard-setting organizations, which is the mundane variety on the left, and standards development organizations. And then, of course, there's a special challenge. If you're putting your technology into a standard, how do you capture value from that, particularly in light of the fact, well, not particularly in light of the fact, but most standard-setting organizations recognize that there are issues here, and they have friend licensing regimes and so forth that try and govern uh, how the rents should be dissipated, or at least how the profits should be shared. But of course, in most standard setting organizations, there's usually more people using technology than there are contributing. And whenever you have that political dynamic, you can always, always be sure that those that contri are contributing are gonna get the short end of the stick, and those that are using will get the better end of the deal until they kill a golden goose. So, so let me come back to the fundamental question as I put it before. No matter how you slice and dice the problem, it's still the same problem. Where's the bottleneck asset in the value chain? And what's the business model that will let the innovation land there and control the bottleneck? Recognizing, of course, the bottleneck keeps moving around. And the story I gave about the microprocessor and memory, you know, at various times it's been the processor that's constrained and memory has been abundant. But then for many years, memory was tight and the processor was not the constraint. With the new innovations coming down the memory, maybe the processor again will become the constraint. And then we're going to run up against the end of Moore's law, maybe in the next three to four years. And then the processor will become the constraint again. And unless we segue to a completely different paradigm of computing, uh, then the processor side will will be the constraint as other technologies move ahead. So um, what I'm suggesting to you is that a story about complements also requires an understanding of co-evolution. So a new, the new vocabulary that one needs to, to, to get out of the static framework, and I must admit my initial simplified framework back in 86 was quite static, you need to understand how all of these complements co-evolve. Once you figure that out, and once you understand the intellectual property protection and the business models that can work, you're one step closer to solving the problem. Which leads me to 
what are the implications of all of this? Um, and as I've said before, compliments are even more important than I thought. Secondly, business ecosystems are increasingly the, relative, the relevant competitive unit or the relevant uh, unit of analysis that no longer, in, in the simplified world of my early paper, I looked at one simple product. But now, of course, you have multiple levels of an ecosystem, with, of course, the top level of the ecosystem perhaps being the Internet itself. And, you know, you have things like Android and other ecosystems nested with an ecosystem, so it gets incredibly complicated. But if you're not aware of the relevant ecosystem and the co-evolution that's taking place within it, then you can't get your arms around this problem. And as I said, the business model choices are even more complex. Uh, there are not only questions about pricing, which is a standard business model question, but you know, as I understand it, Rolls-Royce doesn't sell engines anymore, it sells time. Um, and so there, there are all kinds of service models, and in fact, uh, there's, I think, a burgeoning literature on, on the services industry, which indicate that maybe the product world is a thing of the past. And then, of course, you have to recognize the special challenges associated with the general purpose technologies. The hardest nut to crack from a profiting from innovation point of view is the general purpose technology. So, not surprisingly, what do people in Silicon Valley focus on? They're not focused on general purpose technologies. They're focused on what can I get money out of in five years? Uh, so, my friend Bill Spencer, who was in charge of Xerox Park for many years, was always concerned we're eating our seed corn as a nation. And uh, maybe the whole world is eating its seed corn because there's not enough incentive in the system to support general purpose technologies, or what some people call generic technologies. And having gone through this exercise, I was reminded of the work of Richard Nelson 20 years ago, where he made a passion case for a passionate case, not just for support of basic research, which is what economists have always been willing to do since the early work of Ken Arrow in that area, but also of this other category called generic research, which actually requires deciding you know, a little bit about what areas of application, without being specific, what one should be supporting. And of course, we do that with NIH and various other uh, parts of the innovation ecosystem, but there's no formal conceptual framework for dealing with that, and I suggest that this general purpose technology idea is perhaps a way to get there. So you'll be pleased I've got to my last slide. Um, and just to quickly summarize, uh, I realize that the steepest ramp for innovators uh, is around general purpose technology, which says if you're smart, you shouldn't spend your money on that as an innovating firm uh, because the business model is not yet there, particularly with the courts uh, being increasingly reluctant to, 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 to recognize patents and uh, you know, there's a great tendency to uh, to go with the infringer, uh, even in the United States, which historically has been a, you know, a champion of intellectual property. I see the antitrust authorities poking their nose into a lot of intellectual property disputes. And one thing you can be sure of is the antitrust authorities and the competition authorities know nothing about innovation. Uh, and they have static models that uh, ignore what, in my view, are the key policy questions. So there's both a management issue and a policy issue uh, associated with that. Um, ecosystem should be center stage. In fact, you know, in the business strategy literature, ecosystems are being talked about for quite some time, but no one has bothered to try and harness all of that insight around what does that mean for profiting from innovation? What does it mean for capturing value from innovation? And then finally, you know, how do you deal with these sticky public policy questions uh, that, in my view, are just as critical as the management questions? And I hope that that's enough to stimulate a few questions uh, and uh, enable uh, an informed discussion. And more importantly, I'm hoping that this will stimulate the research of many of you in the audience that I know have got a lot to contribute in this area. So that's my hope and aspiration. I'm happy to take any questions.
two roving microphones. If I can just get people to hold that. Yep, so there's one up at the back there, please. Thank you, David, for a fantastic talk. Um, I've long been interested in uh, generic technologies and general purpose technologies, particularly uh, advanced materials and nanomaterials. And many Can of these you speak up a little? It's sure. I was saying I've long been interested in uh, generic technologies and general yeah. purpose technologies, um, particularly advanced materials and nanotechnology, which follow many of the same principles that you've talked about and the disincentives. And uh, the president of MIT talked recently about uh, leaving too much ketchup in the bottle. Um, about not tackling, our ecosystems not tackling, directly your last point there, um, the big picture innovations that could solve social and economic challenges. And I wonder if you could speak to some of, uh, Raphael Rafe talked about um, innovation orchards and some of the, uh, the mechanisms that could be used with the university and government uh, and industry collaborations to try to address those sort of problems. I wonder if you could speak to some public policy initiatives that might help with this um, Yeah, th this I've got one, obs one observation and one observation only. And that is, as an economist, one is always reluctant to step into this area called industrial policy for fear that you know, the government will screw it up when it comes to picking winners. The, here's the good news. The good news is, with the general purpose technology, the technology, it's not too late once the technology gets invented to think about the next step. So it's not a matter of trying to pick winners from things that don't yet exist. With general purpose technologies, you know, there's something there that you can see that's tangible. And smart people uh, and people both of technical and business inclination can talk about the future evolutionary paths of those technologies and you can put your money down there. So I think that there's a way to get out from under the criticism that you're trying to pick winners, and we know for sure the government can't do that, by saying, no, we're going to look at things that are established winners, but they're in the early stages. And by laying out the criteria of what a general purpose technology is, it's something that you can add a lot of other things to. That, that you know, if the technology that's evident meets the criteria and you're confident or can be reasonably confident there's lots of other things you can bring to it and I think nanotechnology falls into this category, then it's something that's worth spending public monies on. In fact, it's something, given my framework, that you have to because you're not, there is not a business model out there that enables the innovator to spend that money and expect to get a decent return because uh, the challenge, the, the, the appropriability challenge is just too hard. Because of the inherent limits of licensing. If licensing, and this is the bit that I would love to ram into the heads of people in the antitrust department who are always finding <coughs> something. They're always throwing sand in the gears around licensing because they think that once technology is there, everyone should have it for nothing, shouldn't they? So, you know, the biggest enemy in public policy, the circles that I work in, is the guys in the Justice Department in the United States and in whatever EU uh, the Competition Bureau is there. They're not friendly to innovation. They claim to be friendly to innovation. They will articulate that, yes, innovation is a handmaiden of competition. And then they'll pull out their static bottles from the microeconomics textbooks, which, of course, say nothing about this, and they'll make policy error after policy error. So I think that uh, thinking sensibly and bringing forward this whole general purpose technology idea is sort of mainly stuck with the economic historians. It's not really made it into the business strategy literature, and it should, and it's one of the goals of the paper that lies behind this presentation to try and do that. Great. Other question, please. Uh, one in the middle there, please. And then... Christian Bergen from Sweden. I have a question related to the speech yesterday from AstraZeneca. One problem he did not mention was a really serious problem. It's not, it's not complementary technology, but it's technology we need of great social value, multi-resistant bacteria problem. We are approaching the end of antibiotics. And drug firms, no, big pharma don't take, the, they don't, as, we, as far as we know, can you speak have, up? Have, they have huge difficulties in addressing these issues because how will they profit? 
if you develop these new, new generations of antibiotics, how will they profit from this? So they go in some other direction instead of, so what would be your suggestion if you want to well, well, solve I, this problem? I, I think the, to the extent to which I understand your question, there are many things and, um, you know, antibiotics, so-called drugs of low commercial value. I think the public policy rule should go something like this. You know, is this socially valuable? Do you check the box? And the question is, is there a business model that, you know, private providers can reasonably create that will enable them to profit from dealing with this issue? If the answer is yes, then probably you don't need public support. But if the answer is no, then you do need public support. And I think that's where understanding business models, the limits of licensing, and all those things can really help bring a more sophisticated discussion uh, to the policy question. So I, I, I may be an oblique answer to your question, but, uh, but I do think that, that public policy uh, analysis of these questions has to deal with business model questions. Um, and if they do, uh, they'll may be able to make a more compelling case uh, from time to time for support of, of pharmaceutical products and other things that have, quote, low commercial value. It's not that they have low commercial, they have high social value, low commercial value, because the business model's not there. Um, but you want to establish that that's the reason, it's not just that firms are screwing up and they're not imaginative enough on how to extract value. There was one there, please, back left. Thanks, Nitish. Hello. Uh, uh, I think uh, you highlighted the importance of complementary assets, complementary technologies. Um, I think the literature, uh, as well as the public policy maker, uh, platform owners, they often forget that the agents who actually make this complementary technology is the complementors. So my question is whether you have any perspective on, you know, how to kind of re make relationships or manage, you know, growing that community of comp complementors. Yes, uh, very good question. Uh, so if I can reframe it, in, in light of the fact that there's going to be all kinds of complementary assets, and there's no way the focal firm can create, uh, what can they do to stimulate the complementos? And of course, this is what managing an ecosystem is all about. And this is where I think Microsoft went too far. You know, anytime something popped up, they felt they would either knock it down or buy it. You know, uh, they, they were not as, Microsoft was not as good at sort of cultivating its ecosystem as I think Apple has been and, and uh, Google with, with Android has been. So there's some judicious level of uh, cultivation, if you will, of ecosystems that are necessary in, in order for the focal firm, the innovating firm, to get ahead. But it does leave open the question that, all right, um, who's going to, in the end, benefit the most? And, and how does the innovator well, the focal firm makes sure it's, it's, it's the innovator and not the complementers. And, and that's where I think you have to bring in this sort of notion of co-evolution. Uh, and if your co-evolutionary analysis says that this set of complementarities over here is going to be critical, then the firm must invest in those. Um, and and <clears throat> Henry Chesbrough and I did a paper for the Harvard Business Review about, oh, it was 15 years ago now, called When is Virtual Virtuous? And it was about, you know, when, when, when is it not a good thing in the innovation context to outsource? And I think the answer is when your co-evolutionary analysis says that the complement's going to become increasingly important. For instance, if it's cell phones and battery length is going to be most important, then maybe you need to be pushing battery technology and actually owning some position there. So you've got to do this co-evolutionary analysis and figure out where the future bottleneck's going to be and that's where you need to land. That's where this framework takes you. It says the bottleneck keeps moving around, and if you're not owning and controlling it, you're not going to be the one ringing the cash register. The other guys are. And of course, from a societal point of view, you want the innovator to be ringing the cash register more so than the complementers, because presumably you want to reward innovation, not just complementarity, even though the complementers make useful contributions too. We have time for one last question. Down at the front here, please. 
Hi, uh, I am Dilek from uh, Sabancı University, Turkey. Um, your framework is great. I really like it. For the majority of the business world, that's a uh, very likely applicable model, but it is missing something. And I would like to have your opinion on that, your comment. Uh, social enterprises and social economy. Social. Sharing economy, those uh, oh, that sure. are available now through the digital uh, technologies that lay the ground also. We are in the UK that has the largest social economy in the world, uh, social enterprises, and there are social innovators that doesn't want to capture the value, but generate the value for society. So I would like to uh, see well, your take right. on that. Maybe there's two questions in there, and, and let me make sure I understand the one. I, I'm focusing on the private capture of returns, recognizing you know, behind all of this is a study of Mansfield and others that shows that the social returns to innovation are many, many, many times the private returns, which means that as a society we're underinvesting, which means that it's good to get the private returns up, otherwise you won't get more investment in innovation. You know, why is Britain not investing as much? Because it's had such a poor run of luck uh, with commercializing its technology. So. So behind it all, behind my framework is sort of this sort of fundamental theorem of welfare economics that you have to bring the private returns closer to the social returns or society's gonna underinvest. So either the government comes in and puts some money in or you provide incentives for innovators because if you don't provide incentives for innovators, you won't get the innovation. So that may be one version of your question. The other one I thought you were asking is about the sharing economy and how does that play in and I think at least in my view, the sharing economy comes in through the complementarity stories. That is about sharing and, and all the things that you need in order to make a technology successful. But, but the, 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 the mission that I'm on is to try and explain the most with the least. It's not a theory otherwise. I mean, you could pack this thing up such that it has no freeboard uh, and, and and, and, and what I'm trying to do is create a simple framework that can explain a lot. So I'll have to give some more thought to your question. Um, and, uh, and what I'm trying to run with right now is taking the same framework and tweaking it a little bit and showing how it's applicable to, to the digital economy. Um, and I, and I, 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 I think that with the addition of the story about general purpose technologies and a better understanding of standards that, that, that this simple little framework uh, is you know quite relevant to understanding the convergence in the in the digital economy. Great. So I'm afraid, in the interest of time, we have to draw this to a close. But David, you're going to be around for the rest of today. So it just remains to say thank you very much for that great talk. <laughs>
uh, American series. The thing about The Wire is uh, it has a very slow build-up, and you sort of think, why am I, why am I watching this? What's going to happen? And then, and then you get into the meat of it, and it's, uh, it's really fantastic. So I'm hoping there's going to be an element of, uh, of that to my talk this morning. So I'm going to give you a, a gentle introduction to our national health research system. Uh, that's really important as background um, and context uh, and just sets the scene. And then um, we're going to get into the interesting stuff about a third of the way through, so bear with me. So the NIHR is a bit like uh, the National Institutes of Health in the US, only we're more complicated than that. Um, we have a budget of just over a billion pounds a year, and actually we have a, a dual purpose. So our remit is to improve the health of the nation through research, but also to improve our economic wealth, um, which I suspect is quite unusual for a, a government health department to fund that. And where do we sit? So we're the blue bit in this. We don't do basic research. Uh, we do what you can see on the slide is applied research. So we bridge, we bridge from the very basic research into the patient in the hospital. That's our interest. Uh, and David uh, talked about uh, business models and, and government funding uh, for innovation. Uh, so we quite openly fund market failure. It's not the only thing we do, but we do fund market failure. That's part of our role. I don't know if this looks complicated. Does this look complicated? Probably not in Cambridge University. It's probably quite simple. This is, this is the, our entire billion pounds a year on one slide. Uh, so as you can see, we, this bit, faculty at the top, people, uh, we fund or support over 30,000, over 30,000 researchers um, in our health service. And we have research programs I'm sure lots of people know about research programs. You're probably well-versed in applying for grants. Um, the systems that underpin it and infrastructure. So I'm just going to, as part of the scene setting, give you a, a brief explanation of what that is. And that's the area that my office looks after. So we support over 100 research centres and facilities across the UK. They tend to be often in partnerships between universities like this one and teaching hospitals. So here in Cambridge, for example, there's a large biomedical research centre uh, that we currently fund to the tune of about £100 million that does some of the excellent research you'd expect in Cambridge. And we've really transformed um, the landscape, we feel, by doing this. So what? <laughs> well, firstly, um, when I was offered this job and I told some of my friends and colleagues that I was leaving industry to, to come in to uh, work in this area, everybody told me I was completely mad. <laughs> People told me I was completely crazy to leave the private sector and work in health research in the UK. Uh, I even had a distant cousin whom I'd never met phone me up out of the blue and said, are you mad? <laughs> Why are you doing this? And the reason everybody did that is because uh, we were losing research from the UK. So six years ago, uh, the mood in England in research uh, was awful. F uh, pharma companies were shutting down R&D facilities. And here I was leaving a perfectly good job in industry to come back into this side of the fence to try and persuade people to work with these centres and units and broker partnerships with industry. Which leads on to business models, following on from David. So one of the key questions on my mind when I started was, how are we going to apply some business strategy to turn that around? And it's quite tricky applying business school strategy to a national health research system. In fact, I'm not sure it's been done elsewhere. But we took a, I thought we needed a resource-based strategy where we brought together all the centres and units to do things collectively that you couldn't otherwise do. So this is what we did. So uh, first, one of the first things we did is we set up these things called translational research partnerships. And we've done two 
one in uh, lung disease and one in uh, joint and related diseases. Uh, so this sounds like a reasonably good idea, right? You bring together national collaborations. But how difficult is it to do this? So to do these, for example, uh, we had to bring together over 36, over 36 universities and teaching hospitals, over 36 <laughs> universities and teaching hospitals to work together as one team. So imagine that. I mean, Oxford and Cambridge are in this. I mean, you guys have been competing with each other for over 800 years, and we were saying, you've got to work as a team, together with London, together with the other centres. So it was quite tricky, um, as you can imagine, but we did it. So it's a good example of it's not just what the strategy is, but how you do it that's important. So here's an example of a disease area that we, that we tackled. Um, this is my one of my shoulders, which does unfortunately suffer uh, from arthritis. Um, having an injection, I've had this injection. I can tell you it's not a fun day out. <laughs> so I, no one would be more pleased than me if we could find some improvement in uh, treating arthritis. And over half a million people in our country, in the UK, um, suffer with rheumatoid arthritis. So one of these research partnerships was looking at could we prevent arthritis? Not just could we treat it, but could we prevent it? I don't know if you know, but there is no current prevention for rheumatoid arthritis. To do that kind of science isn't just a resource-based strategy, but you have to have multiple centers working together um, to really combine the capabilities. You can't do this as an individual center. Uh, so imagine if we could prevent arthritis. Well, we kicked off some research on this, and uh, in March this year, I was um, going to my petrol station uh, to fill up with petrol, and I walked in, and I looked at the newspapers, and I saw we were on the front page of one of our national newspapers. So here we are. And this is because, uh, actually, we have kicked off, uh, through this national uh, collaboration, the world's largest <coughs> piece of research in preventing arthritis uh, involving um, 35 research centers across the country. So it's a really good example of how resource-based strategy for us has helped us not just uh, compete in science, but also to do the kind of research that you just can't do any other way um, other than through combined capabilities. In terms of today's conference and R&D management, it may be of interest that actually if you turn to page two of the newspaper, they didn't just talk about arthritis, they talked about the R&D management of it. They actually talked about our research partnership program. So I'm not really aware that we've uh, previously hit the national press in R&D management, but here we are, Daily Express, big newspaper, and uh, the subject of this conference today was in our, one of our Britain's largest newspapers. Uh, so we've done a variant of this. We've done uh, something like this in dementia and also in rare diseases. And uh, here's some press. This is our minister, George Freeman, life sciences minister, talking in the press about some work we did um, in uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, again, through this kind of partnership. So people no longer uh, tell me that I'm completely mad for taking this job. Um, here's some independent research by Rand, um, which shows... Uh, that actually not only was I not mad, but the entire NHR has been really rather successful. So that's the context. The next bit. I've waited uh, two years nearly to talk about this. Uh, so you are today uh, the first people to hear me talking publicly about this program. And this program is why I go to work in the morning. Uh, research is not a speedy business, right? Um, so we know on average it takes about 17 years to develop a new drug. That is a long time. What were you doing 17 years ago?
10 years of that sits with us. Even 10 years ago, what were you doing 10 years ago? It's a different world, right? So, with this program, we're going to try and knock 20% off that timescale for every disease and every therapy that's researched through our billion pound a year health research system. And actually, we are doing it. We really are doing this. <clears throat> so we've taken five steps. Uh, we obviously needed to understand and analyze current timescales for our research programs and all the other activities that are going on in reducing time delays and look at the processes involved, all the stuff you can see on the slide. But that's a really complicated thing to do for a billion pound a year health research system. Uh, actually, I came here to Cambridge and we asked for some help, for some very knowledgeable colleagues, and they said, oh, that's difficult. So this is what we've done. This is our approach. Um, it's been phased. We've looked at incremental change and disruptive change. Uh, I don't know if anybody, did anybody watch the last Olympics, Olympic cycling? Some of the Brits, you guys may have watched the Olympic cycling. Of course, Britain did really well in the Olympic cycling. And I don't know if you know why we did really well in the Olympic cycling, but we did really well by doing nothing radical. Actually, it was lots of tiny changes, small change in diet, small change in the shape of the bicycles, small changes in the training regime. But the result was that actually we came away with more gold medals than anyone else by far. So cumulative change actually can be quite important. But this program is a bit like uh, British Olympic cycling in that respect. And the other really important thing about this is our approach is pragmatic. This really is key. It's not just what we do, it's how we do it. That's really important. <laughs> so we're working across our entire health research system, and that's not to be underestimated. Remember, we employ or support over 30,000 staff. Um, we have a lot of people involved in this, um, but it's not who's involved, it's how we work together, how we do it. So it's how the relationships work uh, and how we work together effectively as a team. The second bullet on this is also really important. This is our high-level political support. So we're going to consider also some fairly radical changes in research, and we're going to need high-level political support to do that. So myself and the colleague I'm leading with, Lynn Kerridge, we had uh, dinner. We did this through dinner. We had lots of dinner and a bit of wine with the Chief Medical Officer for England, Dame Sally Davis, to persuade her that this was worth backing, um, which she did. And we also learned, um, we did a bit of background research to find out where it might work. So the original background research was a meeting with the government's head of continuous improvement to see how we might approach it, um, Kate Silverton. And uh, she taught, um, originally sparked the idea for it over uh, how to make a better cup of tea through lean. And uh, we thought, well, I wonder if you can make a better cup of tea, could we uh, use that principle of lean to uh, change our entire health research system? So we benchmarked lots of places, Food and Environment Research Agency, the Environment Agency, other research funders, to see um, what we could do. We've collected a lot of data, grayed out bits because the data isn't public, but we've looked at things like um, uh, topic development, protocol development, funding, startup, uh, to see where they could be optimized. And this is what we have to simplify. This is the simple version of our health research system that we have to simplify. <clears throat> we've done over 100 hours of interviews for people across the entire health research system talking to multiple stakeholders uh, right across the piece. So we've done our homework. And we developed a plan. So we developed a realistic plan based on that research to see what 
could we save off that 10-year time scale that's in our control? And the plan is that we can save 20 months. A 20-month saving would be a huge deal because that would be 20-month time reduction on average for the development of every therapy and every disease that goes through um, our national health research system. <coughs> so we're now implementing that plan. Uh, it's due for completion by October 2017. Uh, incidentally, we completed part one on time, despite the complexity of it. And so the last part of the presentation, I just want to give you a behind-the-scenes look at the work streams that we've got going on, um, just to share with you what we're, what we're up to. Firstly, we recognize there are many different types of time lags in research. Some of those time lags are quite useful because in research, time is valuable sometimes. Some of them are not necessary at all. <clears throat> so handover is really interesting. If uh, you come to somewhere like Cambridge University, a lot of fantastic breakthrough science is done. <clears throat> but the real drive for that often is um, publication in high-impact journals. And there may or may not be a driver then to take it forward into much more applied research. So there's a kind of baton pass that needs to happen. And nowhere in the system is anyone coordinated the baton pass. Um, I mean, it really struck us when we were doing our research, we organized a meeting in diabetes to get people from right across uh, the breadth of diabetes research from early breakthroughs to sort of late phase research. And um, uh, one of our real world leading light called Rory Holmer from Oxford uh, talked about his early experimental research in diabetes. And he said, but I don't know who to hand it to afterwards. When I've done my bit, I don't know who's going to pick up the baton afterwards. And in the meeting room, that day, around the table, was the guy who was ex interested in exactly that. And said, but it's me, and we've known each other for years, and you need to talk to me, because I'll take that piece of research and get it into the clinic and get it into the patients. So this handover is really important. Um, Dissemination. Those of you who are doing research, I don't know, do you think about, how much do you think about dissemination of your research? Um, how seriously do you take dissemination? When you're writing grant applications, how important do you think dissemination of research findings are to a research funder? So we're looking at this really seriously. Improvement of dissemination to evidence users. <coughs> And we are the British government's largest funder of research by far. So this, this is quite significant. Uh, we also need to develop some metrics to see how we're doing. There's no real benchmark for us. Um, and uh, uh, many of the things that we're trying to measure are really difficult to measure, really difficult to measure. So uh, uh, we've got work underway. We've got some great people working on this. But if you're looking for areas that you might want to do some research in, you know, come and have a chat, because this might be an area of, of fertile ground for research in itself for those who are interested in it. We, we already have evidence user input, um, but could we do better? And I wonder, for those of you who are active in research, you know, how seriously do you take evidence user input in designing your research. Maybe you do take it seriously, but, but we're looking at uh, strengthening this area. So in our case, obviously, it's doctors and nurses and clinicians and so on, um, but also people who pay for research, NHS managers might have an interest in that. Um, we're looking at this very seriously. So again, we are the government's, British government's largest funder of research, and we're looking to see what, how we might strengthen evidence users' input into research design. Peer review. We're looking at peer review completely open-minded. Um, I think we probably have just about concluded that we will continue with peer review. Uh, but I would say uh, there was a point in the project where we were wondering whether whether or not to continue with peer review. That's how radical we're being. 
And that's how seriously we're taking being radical. Um, so I think we probably are going to uh, look at it, but we're going to look at it in terms of being proportionate. And what is proportionate peer review? Could we do things better? Uh, could we do things more digitally? Uh, you know, I personally wonder whether panels always need to sit around the table face to face. You know, we do everything else digitally. So um, we're um, taking a fresh look at, at peer review. And contracting. I don't know how many of you have been involved in uh, contracting when you get uh, grants in from research funders, but it takes a long time. It can take months uh, sometimes to get the contract signed off. Uh, and some of that time is, of course, is very important around intellectual property and so on. But if we could shave any time off that, um, I mean, if it takes, say, six months to sign a contract for a piece of research, and there's maybe four, five, six studies involved in developing a new therapy, well, that could be two or three years worth of drug development time spent on contracting. You know, are the lawyers the people we want spending time on developing new medical therapies? So we obviously won't get away with no contracting, but uh, we're taking a, a look at how we could shave some time off that. And of course, as I mentioned, it's not just what we do, but how we do it. Delivery is really important. So that means excellent change management by us. Excellent teamwork by us. And really excellent delivery by us. So we're not just talking, but we're delivering what we say we're going to deliver, and we're delivering that on target. Uh, clearly, those work streams have, have you know, very different degrees of um, complexity, and they're all going to deliver different time savings. Um, so that's a key part of our management, the R&D management aspect of this. Uh, but I personally feel very strongly this is really, really worth all the effort uh, that we can put into it. You know, imagine if we can uh, knock 20 months off the average time to develop any new therapy for any disease through our national health research system. You know, that is, uh, that is well worth the effort. Thank you very much. and public and academia, yeah. uh, what else there, to try and deliver social and economic value and to do it all much quicker and simpler. Is that right? That's what we do in the morning anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to propose is that that beautifully links to the, uh, co the uh, concepts introduced before by, by David. So I'd like first to open up for any specific questions on issues to do with NIHR and the way in which it, it manages this billion pounds a year of research to do something in a highly accelerated environment. There's one question there in the white shirt, please. Uh, hi, thank you. Are we good? Um, so, uh, Alex Quayle, BP. Uh, I'm fascinated by what you've described. I think it's really interesting. Um, and in particular, I was struck by, uh, by, by um, the challenge of changing a system that's humming and whirring and doing research day by day that you don't want to uh, upset, but you're no. also bringing together people who might have been working on competitive uh, research in, 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 in some areas as well. The question I have is, how did you go about incentivizing the change all the way through um, the structure of, of, of the research programs? I guess people are quite used to seeing initiatives come and go. So, so maybe you could talk for a second about how that worked. Yeah, absolutely. So we're really acutely aware of that. Um, <coughs> we've done this uh, program, this change program, in two parts, really. first part was 18 months, and we, we really uh, we planned it as 18 months, and we deliberately planned that as a, a long time scale uh, because we didn't want to disturb um, any parts of the system. You know, it's very easy to have um, change one part 
in a system this complex and get a perverse outcome uh, at the other end. So uh, that's why we had a very careful analysis phase in phase one. And we spoke to everybody we possibly could in the system from a, a real, really broad spectrum of researchers in different diseases, so everything from dementia research to diabetes, but also in different parts of the system from people doing, you know, amazing breakthrough science, first in human trials through to people doing you know, late phase trials just to test it was safe in patients. So uh, <coughs> that's how we approached it. We approached it very carefully. Um, but we delivered that project, part one, on target. Um, and the second phase of the project, we're also, you know, of every intention we'll deliver that on target. You know, the, the reason why um, uh, I've not spoken publicly until today, actually, is because I just wanted to be really careful that we were delivering before we talked and that it wasn't initiative-itis. So uh, it's difficult, it's complicated. We'll uh, see uh, what we do implement. Um, but frankly, even if we can reduce that average time by five months, that would be an amazing uh, efficiency improvement to do that. Um, we are really, as I said inside, really pragmatic about this. Really practical, really well project managed um, to make sure that we, uh, you know, this isn't just words and that we, you know, we've got a really strong fighting chance of delivering it. At the back, please. Thank you for that great presentation. Uh, 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 awesome challenge that you've taken on. Um, I wonder if you've thought about coordinating uh, within that 10-year time window, and particularly towards the end, uh, the incentives of star scientists within your system uh, to start ventures, uh, either you know, they're grad students or they themselves, and have you coordinated with the universities or the research institutes to look at the policies that may be holding them back from that, from perhaps appropriating value from some of those breakthrough inventions? That's a great question, and we've had that kind of question many times. The answer is not yet. So I'll explain that. When you look at this whole area of medical research, it's really easy to get drawn into all sorts of things that are kind of half in our control or slightly outside of our control. So part of, uh, part of the, the reasons that we're... we're um, confident about delivery is we've been really self-disciplined about only having in scope the stuff that we've got direct leverage over. So the recommendations we had um, for part one of the project based on the analysis, which are the work streams we've got taken forward, um, any action we take from those, um, I feel if I go to my board 